Welcome to the Shining Light Podcast. This is Pastor Sam, and I'm joined with today by a very special guest. I'm joined with Trevor Loudon. How are you doing today, Trevor? I'm doing great, Pastor Sam. It's a, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I'm enjoying being back in Iowa. It's fantastic. Yeah, there, there is really no place quite like Iowa. Uh, in fact, I, I hear the weather in Iowa is even better than, than where it is down south where you're from. Yeah, look, um, I really, f- you know, I, I was suffering... While you were having, you know, sub-zero temperatures, I was sweltering in 60 or 70 degrees down there in Florida, and, and I was so wishing I was back in Iowa. Oh, man, that would have just been miserable. I can't believe oh, you had to suffer like that. Oh, 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 I know, but the things you do, <laughs> the sacrifices you make for the cause, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you made that sacrifice going down to Florida so you could, uh, uh, you, you know, wouldn't have to enjoy this, these good Iowa winters that yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah, well... I'm a bit, of a bit masochistic at times, but, you know, I just think the cause comes first and I have to suffer in the heat and while you're enjoying the snow up here, well, that's just the way it is. Yeah. So, so now, you're, you're in Florida right now, but your, your accent uh, speaks to the fact that you're from somewhere else originally. Yeah, it's a southern accent. Yeah, it, southern. It, it is. Is it a little bit more south than Texas even? Yeah, look, it, it's even further south than... Uh, than where most of the Democrats come from in this country, you know, it's um, <laughs> it's actually from New Zealand, right in the right in the bottom of the South Pacific, and I, I just just you know people always ask me they say why do you why is a New Zealander because I, I live here now most of the time I'm married mm-hmm. to an American, you know why do you care about America and I say well, you know the first is you know my country was saved in World War Two, you know we were facing invasion by the Japanese. And if it hadn't been for the farm boys of Iowa fighting out in, in Guadalcanal on the Coral Sea and Midway, we would have been done. And so um, anybody who cares about freedom, no matter what part of the planet you live on, you have to care about America. Because if America goes down, we lose it everywhere. If America can be saved, that's going to help every freedom-loving country around the world. Well, that's you know that's that's an incredible testimony to hear because it, it's so tough in our culture today to hear a lot of uh, people who were born and raised in America have really a hatred for America. Um, you know, I, I I'm hesitant to call them Americans because they don't really have the spirit of America in them or or have the appreciation for the freedom that we have or the founding fathers that came before us. Uh, and, and those, uh, as you even mentioned, those who uh, sacrificed their life and ever put their life on the line for our freedom. But yet here you are from New Zealand, and you have just a great appreciation for this this nation. And uh, that, that is refreshing to hear. In, in, in and and, it, and it's, it's true, you know. Look, um, I grew up in a country where we did appreciate that. And since that time, a lot of our youth have fallen the same way your youth have fallen, you know, because there's a, such a thing, critical theory. It's a Marxist concept, and it was brought to this country by the Frankfurt School and the followers of Antonio Gramsci, the Italian communist, criticize everything about America, criticize the religion, the race relations, the economy, the education system, the civil government, criticize, 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 criticize the founding fathers. They weren't noble Christians who gave you the best system of government the world has ever seen. They were mendacious slave owners. You know, America didn't get rich through freedom and prosperity and innovation. It got rich through ripping off the third world. And that's what Mm. these young kids are endlessly taught. They're endlessly taught Marxist propaganda to turn themselves against their own country. And you've got to say it's been successful. To a, to not all of them, but to a large degree. Yeah, r- unfortunately, that really has been successful, that critical theory and, and what you're outlining, uh, especially with Gramsci. Gramsci was the, the guy who kind of uh, invented the idea of cultural Marxism. Isn't that uh, correct if I'm, mm. I- if I'm bringing that, that up and, and that idea right? Yeah, well, look, look um, Lenin had the idea that the, Lenin and Marx had the idea that uh, the working class would rise up mm-hmm. and overthrow the bourgeois and established the workers' state socialism leading on to communism. Gramsci, after World War I, there were several attempted communist revolutions in Hungary and uh, Germany and Eastern Europe, and they all failed. And Gramsci, when he was sitting in a prison cell, he was imprisoned by, Ita- by Mussolini, 
he, he thought this through and he thought, well, you know, look, the working class has been so indoctrinated by Christianity and the system that it thinks it has an interest in it. And so we, if we're going to have a revolution, we've got to change the culture. We've got to mm. change people's thinking so they become socialist in their thinking, so they're ripe for revolution, so they drive the revolution themselves. So the idea was you, you infiltrate the churches, you infiltrate education, the labor unions, the government, even the military, every institution to turn the people into socialists. And at the same time, you had the critical theory coming in through the Frankfurt School, which were, were largely intellectuals driven out of Nazi Germany, communist intellectuals driven out of Nazi Germany. They settled at Columbia University and, and other places. And they just set up a system where everything about American culture, history, politics, society had to be relentlessly criticized. So, and you see this, you know, every time you see an ad, uh, an advertisement on TV, where the father of the family is this bumbling idiot, and all problems are solved by the woman or by the child, that's critical theory. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the patriarch, the male of the family is an idiot. He's an oppressor. And the woman, and it's all, the future belongs to the women and the children. You know, the man has got to be driven out of this. And this is a, this is a Marxist construct because mm -hmm. they need to destroy the family. They need to destroy the existing hierarchies of life. Every time you see something about, you know, George Washington being a slave owner and a, a bad guy and history is all about dead white European males, the Dwem thing, this is all critical theory. There's nothing good about Western civilization. Um, Western civilization is intrinsically corrupt and evil and capitalistic and slave owning and therefore for a better future for mankind we have to destroy all these institutions. Now this is all around us. People think this way all the time. Most of our kids do. And, and this is Marxism. This is cultural Marxism. And this has kind of been uh, what you've given your, your life's work and your life study to go into uh, study and also to expose uh, Marxists and cultural Marxists and, and how they're working. In fact, uh, the, the first place I think that I became familiar with, with who you were was from watching the, the documentary Enemies Within, which you were the, uh, the, the, the narrator of. Would that be what the position yeah, would yeah. be called there? Uh, the narrator of that and uh, is... So what is some of the work that you, you've done? And of course, I mean, uh, if you talk just a little bit about Enemies Within, I'm sure you could talk about that for quite some time. But we want to get to a newer project that you're working on too today. But uh, if you could speak to just a little bit about kind of what your, your life's work is there with studying out these communists and, and cultural Marxists and, and things like that, but then also Enemies Within. Well, look, you know, people um, up until a couple of years ago, it was a little bit tough to sell the idea that Marxists and communists were infiltrating the American system. Because, you know, communism has all gone, it all collapsed, it died with the Soviet Union. But in the last couple of years, people have been a lot more willing to accept that since the election of President Trump, the Marxists and the communists have really showed their hand. Mm -hmm. They have really, really have. But this has been going on for a very long time. Like, I started researching the, uh, the left 30 years ago, and I particularly started researching the American left, the American Communist Party, Democratic Socialists of America, Freedom Road Socialist Organization and other groups. Freedom Road is, is the uh, pro-Chinese Maoist group that gave you Black Lives Matter, for instance. They run okay. Black Lives Matter. And I, I say this, that the Democratic Party has been so penetrated now that you've got at least 100 members of your house, including Dave Lubsack from... Uh, from Iowa here, who are so enmeshed with Marxist groups, socialist groups, or hostile foreign powers like the Cubans, Chinese, and Iranians, that they couldn't pass a background check to drive a school bus. If the FBI wow. checked them out, they wouldn't be allowed to, to clean the toilets at any military base in your country, yet they're serving on the Homeland Security Committee, the Armed Services Committee, the Judiciary Committee, the whole lot. And the same, but roughly the same proportion in the Senate. 
Now, people are all upset right now. They're going, um, you know, we've got Ocasio-Cortez. She's a socialist in Congress. How can we have a socialist in Congress? This is just unbelievable, you know? Well, Jerry Nadler, she's a member of Democratic Socialists of America, which is actually more left-wing than the Communist Party, by the way, and has 60,000 members in this country, including five chapters here in Iowa. And um, she... Uh, but she's a member of that. Well, Jerry Nadler, who heads the Judiciary Committee, the one who's, who wants President Trump's tax records right now, the one who, who would lead the charge to impeach President Trump, he joined Democratic Socialists of America back in the 1970s. He's been an active member for more than 20 years. He is a full-on Marxist, yet he oversees the Judiciary Committee, which oversees the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, on that Judiciary Committee, you've also got Judy Chu from California, who was a long-time supporter of the Communist Workers' Party, a pro-Chinese Communist Party. And you should see Judy Chu attack the FBI whenever they have the temerity to arrest one of the 25,000-plus Chinese spies working in this country. You are racist, she says. The FBI is a racist organization. You're only persecuting these people because you hate Chinese. And she's arranged for sensitivity training for these cruel FBI agents so they don't persecute these Chinese spies any longer. So you have got about four Marxists on the Judiciary Committee. You've got several on the Armed Services Committee. The head of the Homeland Security Committee uh, Benny, Benny Thompson from Mississippi worked with the Communist Workers' Party, the Communist Party, and with Castro's Cuba to send American communists to Cuba to, 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 for, for free medical training by Castro. Most of these kids are children of Communist Party members, so now they're dotted all over this country. And this is the head of the, of the Homeland Security Committee. The same with the Intelligence Committee, the same with all the sensitive committees right now, are all run by Marxists under the Democrats. That, You're completely infiltrated. That, that's, that's just, uh, you know, incredible to hear all that. I mean, uh, l looking out, and you can kind of see the, the different policies that are coming out on both, you know, local, or more than just both, but local, state, national level. Um, it, it's, a, it's not surprising, I would say, to see... And the fact that there, there are Marxists, that there are communists and things like that out there, that, that's not shocking to hear. But the crazy thing is, is to hear how widespread this all is. That's, that's well, the amazing thing. Well, see, this is the thing, is that all the main policies of the Democratic Party right now, and I'm talking things like, you know, obviously Obamacare, the push for mm -hmm. refugee resettlement, the push for illegal immigration amnesty, uh, the... F $15 minimum wage, the Green New Deal, all of those policies come out of the communist movement. Mm -hmm. the, the Democratic Socialists of America invented the Green New Deal. They're working with the Communist Party to implement it. Um, the, the, the Obamacare came out of the Communist Party USA and, um, and, and, and Democratic Socialists of America. The man who gave the idea to Obama was Obama's personal physician a man called Quentin Young, the father of the socialized health care movement in this country. He was Obama's personal physician. He was also a longtime member of the Communist Party and of Democratic Socialists of America. Mo almost every policy being promoted by the Democratic Party right now, from the nuclear deal with Iran to $15 an hour minimum wage to fracking bans to... Um, you know, transgender bathrooms, whatever you think, it's all communist policy. Every single bit of it comes out of the communist movement. The communist movement formulates it. They give it to the unions, which they control, and they control all the major American unions now, and the unions make it Democrat policy. That's how it works. So, the, you know, the amazing thing about all this is, is that as I'm listening to this, and you had mentioned this principle earlier, is that basically the communists, uh, through this cultural Marxism, have decided to go into infiltrate, infiltrate, infiltrate in all these different areas. And, and the different areas that you presented are, are just incredible when you start to think about it, whether it comes to 
as you mentioned, the, um, the, the idea of, of not fracking, the idea of transgender bathrooms, the idea of $15 minimum wage. I mean, you know, why should the government decide how much a business owner should pay his employee? That doesn't make any sense. That's a contract between two individuals. Why should, uh, why should the government go and be uh, saying that, you know what, this person who's not born uh, of this biological gender um, can go and use this bathroom that's designated to a biological gender. I mean, you know, w when you start to look at all these things, why would the government be involved in this? Well, the only reason a government would be involved in this is if there's an agenda behind it. And this agenda, uh, as you've been putting forth, is a Marxist communist agenda. Yeah. It's an agenda to weaken and divide America so America can be taken out of the picture. It, and, you know, one of those areas that has been strongest uh, and, and perhaps is even the foundation of America is the church. I mean, the evangelical bloat voting block has been probably the biggest voting block of the past, well, I don't know, century, maybe longer. And how has this communist agenda, this Marxist agenda, been seeping into uh, evangelicalism, or even more broadly to say Christianity, uh, because I know that's really what you're going to be going over in your new pro uh, project, Enemies Within the Church. And of course, you guys have, uh, if, if you're a listener to this podcast, you've probably heard about that before. We've, we've interviewed Judd, we've uh, interviewed Kerry Gordon, and now we get Trevor Loudon, so this is really exciting. But, but tell us a little bit about Enemies Within the Church. Well, look, um, ever since this republic was founded, it had enemies, because it was the first republic in the world that said that your rights came from God, they came to the people, not to the king, not to the prince, not to the, to the, to the Catholic Church or whatever, not to the Pope or the bishop, they came directly to you. Your rights are God-given, and you have a right to elect representatives to protect your rights in the government. And that representative government basically came out of Mosaic law. So, so if you think every dictator around the world must have been looking at the American Republic and saying, this is not an experiment we want to succeed. <laughs> this is not good. Right. You know, so you've had enemies ever since. Now, this got really bad in the early part of the 19th century because, well, when you had Marxism, Marxism was the first person to sort of make what I would call satanic influence, I would call evil to make it into a science. To, mm -hmm. to, to make the... Because what revolutions... See, we have natural hierarchies in life, you know. is God, man, nature. You know, parents, children. Um, you know, employer, employee. Teacher, mm -hmm. student. These are natural hierarchies of life. And what is revolution but overturning the natural hierarchies of life. Right. And ultimately, if God gave us these natural hierarchies, anybody who wants to turn, overturn those hierarchies is working for the opposition. You okay. Know, it's, it's, yep. so it's, yep. But see, Marx started to make this a science. How do you overturn? How do you scientifically overturn those natural hierarchies? Lenin put it up a notch. He was really organized. He knew how to divide people. He, he, Marx had the broad theory of overturning the hierarchies. Lenin put the nuts and bolts into it. Okay. You know, he really made a, a mechanism out of this, a mechanism of revolution. So the churches were always regarded as the... America was always enemy number one of the revolutionaries because it, mm -hmm. the, it was God's country, right? Okay. It's God's system, and we want to overturn God. So, but America had its churches, and America's churches were very, very strong. America had a revolution, you know, a good revolution against the king because of religious liberty. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about taxes. It was about the fact that thousands of people had come to America to escape religious persecution in Europe and set up their own communities and when they saw King George trying to take away their power and exert his authority over those colonies they knew what was coming they knew the religious persecution they had escaped was coming back and that's why they broke away
So Marxism, Leninism comes along in the 19th century, tw late part of the 19th, the 19th century, early part of the 20th century. Now, so what happened? They, the communists, an actual communist like Harry Ward, the first communist front in America was the Methodist Committee for Social Action, set up by a man called Harry Ward out of um, um, oh, the big theological seminary in New York. I've just forgotten the name of it, unfortunately. But anyway, that was the first communist front, and they spread yeah. communism right through, right through the Protestant churches. What was it? Union Theological U Seminary. Union Theological Seminary. Yes. And was was wasn't Harry Ward? Wasn't he uh, called like the the Red Preacher or something? The Red like Preacher. That? Yeah, because he actually joined the Communist Party, and uh, always secretly, but he was a Communist mm -hmm. Party member. And so they spread the Marxism right through the mainstream churches, and they were very obvious about it. So a lot of Christians left the mainstream churches, and many of them went into the evangelical churches. Okay. And, and so, and the evangelical churches became the bastion of conservatism. You know, they, they were the ones who voted for Ronald Reagan and, and supported Israel, and, and they were very Bible-believing, very, very, very firm in their beliefs. Right. So, and meanwhile, the Catholic Church was being heavily penetrated, through liberation theology, to the point you now have a Marxist pope. The Orthodox churches um, are now, since many of them have rejoined the Moscow Patriarch, which is like the Vatican of the, um, you know, the Orthodox churches, right. which is completely under KGB control, are now, now basically working for the KGB, unfortunately. doesn't mean that every Orthodox preach is a KGB, pre, uh, priest is a KGB agent, but the main leadership of the church right. is now under KGB control. So that left the evangelicals. And these pesky evangelicals kept electing people like Ronald Reagan and, 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 and Donald Trump. You know, this is just not, this could not be allowed to continue. So um, I'll just step back one, because I think there's a story that needs to be told here too, that set this up. Because a lot of Americans have probably heard of the phrase situation ethics. Right. The, okay. uh, Joseph Fletcher, right? Joseph Fletcher, who was at uh, Harvard Theological School, the Episcopalian Theological School, regarded as one of the most influential Protestant churchmen of the 20th century by far. Mm -hmm. Very, very influential. Um, we also know that he helped to set up Planned Parenthood with Margaret Sanger. He also set up with euthanasia, various euthanasia groups. But in 1966, he wrote the book called Situation Ethics. And his argument was this. The old ethics of the Bible, you know, where ethics are set in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, where ethics come from God, these are the rules of life. That's old-fashioned. Because in this modern age, there's so many conflicting things and it's a complex world. So really, the only thing that can guide our decision making and ethics is love. If we do something in love, even though it might conflict traditional ethics, it's okay. If you steal to feed your starving family, that's okay because you love your family. Um, if you're a pastor and you don't want to speak the truth, because you fear it might upset your flock and drive some of your people out of the church and maybe diminish your take in the collection basket, the act of love is to soften your message uh, to keep the people in the pews. That's because you love your congregation. So we're, we're making situation ethics decisions every day. That's now the modern ethical system in America. And it certainly is very much part of the Christian churches. Well, Joseph Fletcher was a communist. Joseph mm -hmm. Fletcher, who left the church after he wrote his book, declared himself an atheist and advocated for post-birth abortion and infanticide up to the age of nine or ten in the, age, <laughs> in, in the case of you know, retarded children. He was identified in congressional testimony as a, as a secret supporter of the Boston Communist Party. He worked on many projects for the Boston Communist Party. He was also involved in many big-time communist Soviet fronts, including the World Peace Council. This guy was basically a Soviet agent, and he transformed the morals of America. 
Well, situation ethics is everywhere now because of this Marxist, Leninist, communist. It, it, it's just amazing whenever I think about the story of, of uh, Joseph Fl Francis Fletcher. Um, he he ended up, uh, just as Trevor was saying, was uh, ended up going and becoming an atheist, declaring himself an atheist. Um, but for three years, he continued to preach or teach at Harvard Divinity School after he declared himself an atheist. And then he won uh, Humanist of the Year, I think, uh, yes, in yes. 1970 or 73 yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And uh, and this is literally, this is the, the as you were saying, Trevor, this is the, the modern view that we have of ethics is all based on the works of Fletcher. I mean, it, it's based on it's, love. love. Yeah. Look, everything is permissible if you do it in the spirit of love. Now, just think of the, the opposite of love right now in America. The opposite of love is, is hate, allegedly, you see. So if you're a modern Christian or a modern social justice warrior, you can do anything you want as long as it's motivated by love. You can destroy somebody's property. You can, you can cause a riot. You can do anything because it's about love. So the opposite of love is hate. So if you do not agree with their agenda, you are a hater. And if everything is permissible in the spirit of love, anything carried out in the spirit of hate would be completely impermissible, would it not? So therefore, you have a moral obligation to shut down haters because you're acting out of love and they're standing against you. So you're okay about shutting down their meetings or phoning in a bomb threat or... Um, rioting and smashing the windows of people you don't like, or sabotaging their car, or, you know, doxing them online, so, you know, um, calling them out, you know. So this is why we have all this hate rhetoric out here right now, because if you stand in opposition to the social justice agenda, which is motivated by love, you are a hater, and haters are scum. They are not fit people to live on this planet and so any conservative who stands up for what they believe in because as you've said to me if you you cannot truly love and i'm talking the true spirit of love here mm -hmm. you cannot love good without hating evil you, you cannot can't. love god without hating the devil you right. cannot love virtue without hating sin right you know so there is but that, but so they've taken the monopoly on love you know, mm -hmm. they, have they think they own love, and therefore, if you're not part of their club, you're a hater. And this is a modern paradigm, and this is all motivated by situation ethics. This comes out of Fletcher, and Fletcher comes out of Marx and Lenin, and the great mm -hmm. revolutionaries. So this is how Marx, Marxist and revolutionary and Leninist ideas are all around us, all around us now. And they motivate communist groups like Black Lives Matter and the communist groups like the Women's March and uh, the anti-fracking movement and anti-FA. All of these are communist groups. And they all have that same ethical system. Anything's okay. Punch a Nazi, punch a fascist, punch a Trump supporter. That's all okay. Because we're the lovers. We love. And they're the haters. Isn't that just uh, crazy to, when you start to actually think about what they're saying and what they're doing, it, it becomes clear that they're not even about love anymore. They, they're they much more driven by their hatred of hate, but yet yeah. that's still hate. Yeah, it, and, it's a complete opposite of the truth. We are the ones who love because we want people to do well. And sometimes you have to chastise people to help them do well. Right. Sometimes you have to call them into account. You know, the Bible it's full of um, calling to rebuke and repentance and, you know, it talks a lot about hell, you know, mm -hmm. um, because there's two sides to love. There's the love of the mother, the nurturing side, the kindly side, the accepting side, but there's also the love of the father. You know, I'll kick your backside if you do disrespect your mother again. Right. If you don't do your homework, you're in trouble, you know, mm -hmm. and that is love as well. But most churches in America today are completely agape love. Just, we'll love you no matter what you do. We'll accept you. Doesn't matter if you break the law. Doesn't matter if you live in sin. That's all okay. You know, and I say, you go back. Most young kids can remember going to church when they're young and listening to a sermon 
and being pretty uncomfortable at times. Because mm-hmm. I think that preacher's talking about me, and he's talking about what I'm doing wrong, and it's pretty, you know, and it can be very uncomfortable. You might break a little bit of a sweat. Well, how many times do you get, to most churches in America now, I guarantee you would never go to a sermon and remotely break into any form of sweat. Right. You know? Most of the time, it's they're giving you some cotton candy and a $5 bill and saying, good job. Yeah, you know, that's it. We, we just love you unconditionally. But but going back to the Protestant to the evangelical movement, because the mainstream Protestants are, are basically the Communist Party of prayer, the Catholic Church has been heavily infiltrated, and I'm not saying there's not there's heaps of good Catholics out there, but but we know what the leadership of the church is about now. Mm-hmm. The Orthodox Church has been pretty much taken over by the KGB, so now you've got the evangelicals, and they keep doing things like standing up for their beliefs. And 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 uh, doing things like crazy stuff, like electing President Trump and President Reagan, so they have to be taken down. They have to be divided. So there's been a big movement in the last few years out of people like Jim Wallace, Obama's faith mm-hmm. advisor, a Marxist, who've been working with people like so, you know so the, the Rick Warrens of the world and uh, and the Gospel Go- Coalition, which, which is led by Tim Keller. And just by the way, you know Tim Keller is a very respected Christian by in many circles. People read his books and they, they quote from his books. But Tim, and the Gospel Coalition sounds like a wonderful group. But, the, but Tim Keller admits in his own works that as a young man he fell in love with the Frankfurt School, the but, Marxist school out of Marxist communist school out of Germany. And the message of the Gospel Coalition is all about changing the values of the church, accepting gay marriage, accepting abortion, um, accepting illegal immigration, um, and moving the church to the left. Critical race theory, all of these Marxist concepts sold as Christianity. And that is infiltrating the evangelical churches like crazy right now. Well, you know, one word that you keep saying over and over, and I'm really glad that you're saying this word instead of a different one, is the word acceptance. Uh, because one of the narratives of the left that comes out is is not acceptance. They like to say tolerance, but really what they're pushing for today is acceptance instead of tolerance. Yeah. Uh, and before I ask you that question, I, I do need to say this here. If you want to find out more about enemies within the church, which is what uh, Trevor is, is working on as a producer and, and working on this, you need to go to enemieswithinthechurch.com. Once again, that's enemieswithinthechurch.com. Enemieswithinthechurchmovie.com. It, oh, movie.com. Enemieswithinthechurchmovie.com. Okay. Yeah. And when you're there, you, since you're going to be at the website anyway, hit the donate button and, and fill that out, right? Yep. Well, it's, it's, the entire project has been funded by public subscription. We've already filmed a lot of it, but we, f- we get some money, we film some. We get some more money, we film some more. So we want to have it finished by this year, the end mm-hmm. of this year, and widely distributed all around the country. We're also going to get it dubbed into Spanish, Portuguese, um, probably French, German, because we think there's a worldwide need for this. This isn't right. just America. Right. So, and we, we really appreciate help with this. This will do more to clarify, I believe, in people's minds. Most people, a lot of people go to church, understand the Christianity they're being taught today is not the Christianity they once accepted as, as standard Christianity. But they're not really sure what's going on. Well, this mm-hmm. will clarify the deliberate um, dumbing down, the deliberate twisting of Christian doctrine, and the deliberate induct- in, in, introduction of socialist and Marxist concepts in the church. So, so as they've, they've gone through and started to introduce these uh, socialist and Marxist ideas in the church, they've kind of moved from tolerating these ideas to accepting these ideas. And we can, you, you know, to throw one out there, uh, a, a term, the same sex attracted is, is one of these agendas that's, that's going on. Could yeah. you explain this a little bit about how this is being worked? And, and if you want to pick a different... Uh, topic to explain it well, that, that might fit better than you could do that too, but I just that was the first one that popped in my mind. Well, look, you know, you, you know, um, most Christians would understand that homosexuality they were regarded as a sin, right? 
because they can quote various biblical verses that would back this up. And this has been a big, a big part of Christian doctrine for a very long time. So people would understand that they may have a, a homosexual who wanted to come to their church and they would accept them. But they would say, you've got to understand what you're doing is sinful and you need to change your behavior. Right? Right. You know, so, right. but no, 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 that's changed to, no, you don't have to change your behavior. Just come to church and you can still keep doing. And that's then gone to, well, no, not only what you, not only we'll sort of accept what you're doing, we'll actually glorify what you're doing. You know, you're actually pretty better than us in some ways. And that's gone from that is anybody who doesn't glorify what you're doing, you are a hater and you should not be. You are the one who now needs to repent. So the whole thing has gone from uh, an acceptance that homosexuality exists but is sinful behavior to now that it not only exists, you have a right to do it and anybody in the church who opposes you is acting out of hate and they are the one that needs to repent and change their behavior there's been a hundred percent reversal and this is not just in the mainstream protestant churches this is now in many evangelical churches as well and at the highest levels even mm -hmm. in the southern baptists they're moving in this direction right now and this right. is just one of the many areas i'll tell you one little example of, of uh, Marxism and the evangelical churches. In the movie, we're going to have a little scene, I think. It's a, a, a group of young Midwestern evangelicals going to a conference in Missouri, right? And it's an evangelical conference for teenagers, and they're all fired up. And one of their main speakers is a young black pastor, a woman pastor from St. Louis, Missouri. She runs a local church, and she gets up and tells him the thing that God wants them to do more than anything else is to end white privilege. This was apparently the 11th commandment or something that, you know, <laughs> got missed out. And so these kids are all, you know, they want to be anti-racist. They want to be good Christians. So they are looking to end white privilege. Well, white privilege is a Maoist communist con concept uh, by a guy called um, Neil, Neil Ig Noel Ignaton. He was a Maoist communist, and he invented this basically to empower the black power movement and stop any opposition amongst you know the, the sort of white community. The woman who gave this, this little address was a member of ACORN, you know, the old ACORN group, Radical Acre, but also a member of the Organization for Black Struggle, which is a front group for the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, a pro-Chinese communist group, the group that gave you Black Lives Matter. So these young evangelical kids are all fired up for communism. They are fired up for ending white privilege, which is a pro-Chinese communist concept that they are hearing about at evangelical conferences. And critical race theory, there was a friend was just telling me the other day, there was a big church in Louisiana that held a jobs fair, but only black kids could come. No white kids were allowed to come to it. This is wow. critical race theory because whites are automatically oppressors. Whites are automatically racists. And you can't have these horrible racist people you know, in your in your institutions, or, or you know, you got to feel guilty for being white, and that's not something you chose. That's something you that was chosen for you, you know. So it's not about sin or your personal relationship with God. It's not about your character. It's about your color, and they. This is pure Marxism, communism, and it's in the churches like you would not believe, and it's. Is sweeping through the evangelical churches right now. The gay movement, critical race theory. You can go to a lot of evangelical churches now. You're going to hear a lot, of, a lot more about global warming and welcoming mm -hmm. illegal immigration and refugee resettlement and ending white privilege and um, social justice than they're ever going to hear about sin or repentance or any of those old-fashioned concepts. Which, you know, these things are, are really kind of... Uh not kind of, but they are very worrisome to me as I as I listen to them and hearing all this stuff that's that's going on. 
Uh, one thing, you know, uh, the idea of social justice and, and the idea of critical race theory are two ideas that, that really come up quite a bit. And one of the issues I see with critical race theory is that it completely denies biblical anthropology, the study of man. Um, you know, the Bible teaches that we're one race, the yeah. human race. There is no distinction anywhere in the Bible based on skin color or any of that sort of stuff. Right. You know, you, you are you are an individual being. You're an individual human being, and you either have a relationship with God or you don't. And that's the critical. That's the critical thing. Right. And um, <laughs> you know, so so, but Marxism is all about classifying people and dividing people. You have to divide to conquer. So if you're a Christian and you've got people in your church, and you're united by your faith. You don't really care where they come from. You don't care if they're from Ghana or from Mexico or from the next town over or what color they are because you're united by a principle. Critical race theory wants you to be divided by your race. Mm -hmm. And white Christians are automatically racist even if they don't realize they're racist. That makes it worse because you're an unconscious racist. racist. And so you can't win and, 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 and you'll believe so you'll believe anything, and, and this is all designed to intimidate and divide and overturn the existing order because they need to destroy the churches. And if you are, and, and, and as I said, we discussed before, if they're bringing all these, these Marxist concepts through the back door, they're dividing the churches and causing all this friction, and so people want unity. Well, the unity is really Christi Christian doctrine. But what they will tell them, the unity is social justice. If we all start redistributing wealth, if we all start um, ending white privilege and we all work together in this big socialist social justice agenda, then we can have unity again. Well, yes, you'll have unity, but well, you had unity in the gulag as well. You yeah. know, everybody got the same uh, thing. Ro Ronald Reagan used to joke, and I thought it was great, he would say, there are two places where communism works. One is heaven, where you don't need it, and the other is hell, where you've already got it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty good right there. Um, so you keep bringing up this term social justice, and, and this is a term that, that we, we talk about social justice quite a bit on this podcast, and it's uh, something that I think that is really important to, to look at. And when it comes to Christianity, the biggest beef that I have with social justice, and there's a lot to be had with social justice there, a lot of a lot of bad stuff in it, is that it changes the narrative of the gospel. You know, the, the narrative of the gospel is that Christ came and he died for our sin. In fact, in Isaiah 53, it tells us that we've oppressed and afflicted him. He's the one who's oppressed and afflicted, and yet he's saving us. And yet, in social justice, the narrative is that we have been oppressed by society, and so therefore we deserve something. The Bible tells us we do deserve something, but we, what we deserve isn't uh, social justice, it's real justice, and that is to go to hell. But Christ paid the price for that so that we don't have to go to hell. But in seeing this, do you think that there is any real compatibility between the Bible and social justice, or do you think they're completely contrary? They're, they're completely contrary. Well, justice does not need a qualifier. Right. When you qualify the word justice, you demean that word. Justice is a perfectly sound concept all on its own. And we know what justice is. Social justice is the idea that society is, is, is intrinsically unjust. So if you must introduce social programs to correct that injustice. And what kind of social programs? They'll be ones that redistribute wealth. Take wealth from those who do not earn to give to those who do. Now isn't there a passage in the Bible that they who does not work shall neither they'll shall ne they who do not work neither shall they eat? Right. Uh, I can't remember that's uh, first or second Timothy it's yeah. in there. But it's, it's it's you know so real justice is you get what you deserve. Right, right, and 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 Christian believes that Jesus gave them a break, mm -hmm. basically, and that putting in crude terms, you know, he gave mm -hmm. them a way out of this, and so social justice means no that 
it's man's job to correct the imbalances of life. It's man's job to, you know, we're all born in different circumstances. Some are born into rich families, some into poor families, some into loving families, some into abusive families. And of course we have a duty to help our neighbour and our own private charity and our own private goodwill, just as you may foster a child, for instance, from a disadvantaged family, or you may donate to charity, or you may run a school, or you may uh, run a mission. All these things are good because that's your private charity to try and help others. You know, love, lo love God and love thy neighbour as thyself. But when you talk about social justice, that implies this is society's issue. Mm -hmm. Society as a whole must redress these imbalances. And how are you going to do that? It means you have to take from some and give to another. You know, so there's a whole bunch, you know, thou shalt not covet comes into there too, you know. Yeah. Um, there's a whole, so social justice is all about encouraging jealousy, encouraging envy and greed. And the, the bottom line is you cannot have social equality without force. Right. And the whole message of the Bible is about free will and individuals choosing to be righteous right. or not to be righteous. So social justice is 100% inimical to the biblical message. It's a, a satanic message. It's a communist message. It is, it is communism. It is Marxism. And um, anybody who thinks that they can be a social justice warrior and a Christian has a deep misunderstanding of both concepts. And so, so this is kind of what you're going to be going over in a, that uh, upcoming documentary, Enemies Within the Church. Uh, once again, that's Enemies Within the Church Movie.com. Enemies yep. Within the Church Movie.com. And so, go ahead and go there, check that out. But before uh, before you leave here, Trevor, I just want to talk for a, a few moments about national security because, we, you know, I look at the the way that the world is going. If you turn on the news, um, there, there's no good news anymore. It's all bad news, but it seems like there's quite a bit of uh, uneasiness going on, whether it's it's in Israel, whether it's in uh, Venezuela, uh, even in the, the United States. You know, there there's quite a bit of, of friction going on. But, but what are some things that you are seeing going on in the world today that we need to know about as concerning national security? Well, one or two good things. I think, um, you know, you've got a President Bolsonaro in Brazil now. And Bolsonaro was elected... Brazil was ruled by Marxists for 16 years, and it was well on the way to Venezuela. And uh, Bolsonaro was elected by a coalition of evangelicals and conservative Catholics. And he is in there right now, in his own words, purging, purging the Marxist scum from the education system. And he's going to remove Brazil from the United Nations. Wow. You've also got Netanyahu in Israel, who just got re-elected, and you've got Donald Trump. Now, I'm not talking that worldly leaders are all the answers, but we do need good leaders. And we have mm -hmm. three sound leaders right now who are working to improve things on our national security. Now, Trump has challenged the Chinese and the Russians like nobody has before. Um, he's removed us from two United Nations bodies so far and hopefully completely takes us out of that. Right, that'd be nice. And, and he has worked on rebuilding the U.S. military. Now, the thing I'll say is, look, looking at Trump, and we all know he's not a perfect individual by any stretch of the imagination, but he is a patriot, and mm -hmm. he is trying to solve this country, to lead this country in the right direction. Now, he's been up against the deep state. Now, what is the deep state? You know, is it just disaffected bureaucrats who have an agenda, or is it a little bit deeper? I, I believe the headquarters of the deep state are in Moscow. Okay. And it filled almost all of the lead, you know, Brennan, a CIA guy, um, voted for Gus Hall, a Communist Party man, a guy's a young man. Comey is a leftist. Um, all of these people, Dinah West, um, th who wrote the great book American Betrayal about the infiltration of communists into the Roosevelt administration, has written a great book called The Red Thread. Just look it up, The Red Thread. And it shows the communist backgrounds of almost all these big players in the so-called deep state, let's get rid of Trump movement. 
So we have a massive movement in this country directed from overseas trying to, you know, rather than Trump collaborating with Russia, his enemies were collaborating with Russia to destroy him. And we have a, a situation in America where the Democratic Party now is pretty much a communist party. It, it effectively is a communist party, allied to the Cubans, allied to Iran, allied to Russia, allied to China. Mm -hmm. You've got a Republican Party that's full of flakes and rhinos and a few good people, and you've got a president who's basically on our side. America hangs by a thread, and the next election will decide whether we have a Western civilization or whether we don't. It's that close. But there is many positive things, Bolsonaro, uh, you know, what's happening in Israel and what President Trump's doing, and the fact that there are still enough good people in this country, despite the endless prop communist propaganda we get fed every day, mm -hmm. to, to vote the right way when it comes down to it. So, you know, Russia is rebuilding its armaments right now. Russia is allied to China. People need to understand that. They are not separate threats. They're allied in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is a political, economic, and military alliance. They are working with the Iranians and the Cubans and the Venezuelans, um, the South Africans, and several other countries to basically bring us down. So, uh, the North Koreans too, obviously, which is a puppet of Russia. You know, uh, Kim Il Jong, his, his bodyguards are all Russians. You know, people don't understand. The, the, it's not, he's not an independent actor. He does what the Russians will let him do. So we're at a point where the Russians are ahead of us militar militarily. We are rebuilding. But if we can win the next couple of elections and rebuild militarily and keep the economy going, and most importantly, rebuild spiritually in this country, I think we can come to a point where we actually spark liberty revolutions all around the planet, where actually there is a, a revolution against Putin in, in Russia, where the Chinese overthrow their communist leaders, where, the, where we get rid of the Maduro government in Venezuela. And I think in five or six years' time, if we play our cards right and commit ourselves, we could have a world that is much more in our favour than it is now. We could have a, a new golden age of liberty and prosperity that is able to spread the gospel around the world more, far more effectively than it has done. And so I'm not, I'm not a doom and gloom guy at all. I think if we sit back and do nothing um, and don't take back our churches and don't take back our government, our future is extremely bleak. I'm talking a thousand years of darkness. Mm -hmm. But if we do reclaim the churches, if we do reclaim the government and re-establish American values, I can see a period of peace and prosperity and, 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 and human, a, a golden age, really. And we are living in a fallen world. It's never going to be perfect. But we can see a, a much better world out there for a very long time if we take advantage of the opportunities we've been given. You know, uh, if Hillary Clinton had become the president, um, I jo I got to joke. I got to tell this joke. Oh, go for it! Go for do it! You know, do you know that after after Hillary Clinton lost the election to President Trump, um, she wanted to sue the devil for breach of contract. <laughs> but the only problem was he had all the lawyers. <laughs> so that's so, pretty good. That's so, pretty but good. that's a bit cruel on lawyers because I know a lot of great lawyers. But anyway, so I think we're, we're, we're at a point, you know, I think we were given an opportunity. We were given a God-given opportunity in the 2016 election to turn this country around. But, you know, like the Israelites were given a lot of second chances too in the Old Testament. They were given a lot of, you know, they were told, get your act, act together and I'll spare you. But they didn't get many third chances. Right. This, you know? this is our chance. Is that this what you're our, saying? This is our chance. And we better take it. We better not be like the Israelites who didn't take it. We better be. We better take the chance we have been so graciously given, you know. And we better make the most of it. And I think if we do, 
I think we'll be blessed. But if we don't, we have only ourselves to blame for the consequences. That's right. Well, I, I think this has been uh, just a terrific podcast, Trevor. Thank you for, for coming on. Uh, this, was, this was great. Looking at, remember, of course, enemies within the church, as we, we talked about that today, uh, in enemieswithinthechurchmovie.com. And also remember, of course, just looking at this, we're not ending on a negative note, which is good, I, I think, because a lot of times we kind of get dubbed, uh, people like us kind of get, get marked as, oh, you guys are, are doomsday guys. You know, it's just all doom and gloom. But there is hope. There, there is a, a light shining through the darkness, and we can go and, uh, and see that light, and we need to go and be that light and keep taking it, take our churches back, take our govern- government back, and uh, get ready to, uh, to bring Western civilization uh, back to where it once was. Absolutely, and, and beyond, mm-hmm. and beyond, because Western civilization is the vessel in this world to spread the light. You know, it is the way to, 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 to spread the gospel, to spread the light around this world. And if, if we lose Western civilization, we lose that ability. That's right. And uh, I don't think that's what is supposed to happen.